Good morning, and thanks for joining us here today. My name is Lar Elkin. I'm the president of Redex. How many of you have been to one of our Redex breakfasts in the past? Oh, look at that. Lots of familiar faces. And that tells me that our Redex breakfast speakers have been worth your valuable time in the past. That's, that's great. And uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. Thanks for being here. We've been fortunate to have some truly great speakers in the past, and we're really excited about today's speaker. I'm confident that he'll continue to raise the bar on this great tradition. At Redex, we have a passion and a deep commitment to the study of Americana. And we've heard from you that this scholarship provides a vital context from which we can address many of today's leading challenges. Immigration is a great example of that. And that's why we've chosen this as our topic today. In preparing for my intro this morning uh, for our speaker, Paul Finkelman, I realized I had a serious problem. How do you properly describe in just a few minutes the accomplishments of someone who's written 50 books, 200 journal articles, been cited in Supreme Court opinions four times, was an expert witness against the Alabama Supreme Court Chief Justice in the Ten Commandments case, was uh, interviewed in the, and appeared in the Ken Burns documentary on Thomas Jefferson, and one of my favorites, was an expert witness in Popoff versus Hayashi to determine who owned Barry Bonds' 73rd home run ball. <laughs> it's a great story. I heard all about it last night. That just scratches the surface of the achievements of our esteemed speaker this morning, Paul Finkelman. Dr. Finkelman is a historian and law professor, currently the John E. Murray Professor at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. This fall, he'll be a Fulbright Professor at the University of Ottawa. He did his undergraduate work at Syracuse University and received his PhD in American history here at the University of Chicago. Please join me in welcoming Paul Finkelman. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? It's, uh, of course, a delight to be here. And you know, when you, you, you're introduced, I always say, I'd like to meet that person. Sounds interesting. <laughs> and um, then the introduction happens, and you have all of the things that you want to begin with. And then you think, well, maybe I ought to play off the introduction. So in a sense, I want to do that to start. Because the, the Popoff case, which was who owned Barry Bonds' 73rd home run ball, um, aside from the interesting legal questions about why you own a ball if you catch it, in some ways illustrates the theme today. So Alex Popov can't, goes to Giant Stadium. He's a crazy California sports nut. Uh, when he picked me up at the airport, he had like skis and tennis rackets and baseball bats in, in the back of his car. There was no room for my luggage. Had to move his golf clubs. Uh, he's like 6'4". He's the son of Russian immigrants. Uh, he caught Barry Bonds' 73rd home run ball. He is knocked down, essentially mugged, and uh, it ends up in the hand of a guy named Hayashi, who is, of course, the descendant of Japanese immigrants. Uh, Popov's lawyer is Mike Triano, who is uh, uh, an Italian-American, uh, gr grandson of Italian-American immigrants from upstate New York. Uh, his expert witness is the grandson of four Eastern European immigrants from uh, the, the various places where uh, Jews lived in Eastern Europe uh, before World War I. That's me. Uh, the lawyer is, uh, is Judge McCarthy, who we don't have to give his ethnic identity. It's obvious. Uh, Hayashi's lawyer is a guy named Lee, who runs the largest Chinese American law firm in San Francisco. Uh, so if you, and of course, Barry Bonds is an African American baseball player. So you sort of have the entire ethnicity of America crammed into this one case. And in some ways, it illustrates that America is, as we always say, a nation of immigrants. We are all immigrants. Uh, this, of course, is the, the opening picture with Uncle Sam looking at these people and saying, do we really want them? But we should remember the first immigrant issue. And here it is. Those Puritans who came to New England and immediately had anchor babies. And you can see the locals complaining about that. And so, and so it's always important to understand that unless you are 100% Native American, uh, 
you came here at some point in your family history, and there was already somebody here, and you were an immigrant, and you were having anchor babies. And one of the great problems of immigration is that people who are here for a while sometimes forget where they come from. Uh, for example, the President of the United States is the son of an immigrant. He's an anchor baby. His mother was from Scotland. And what happens is people who are like the shadows came as poor immigrants with nothing become the plutocrats and suddenly forget that they come from immigrant families and they believe, well, OK, it's time to shut the door. I'm here. I can keep you out. And so that's another theme of American immigration. And so it's, these are the themes that I want to talk about a little bit. Let me, let me go away from the, the opening pictures. Um, I think I, I don't really like looking at these guys too much, so we'll go back to our anchor babies, because um, that sets the theme. But let me start by, by noting that we are a nation of immigrants. And since you're all librarians, you can understand this. All you need to do is go to WorldCat and put in a nation of immigrants. And pages of books start coming out, including one, when I started doing this work, by a uh, relatively obscure senator named John Kennedy in 1958, <laughs> who wrote a book called The Nation of Immigrants. And then it was reprinted in 1964, uh, posthumously reprinted, with an introduction by uh, his brother, uh, Robert Kennedy, and then reprinted again in 2008 with um, an introduction by the third senator, Kennedy Edward. Uh, and, and that's simply an illustration of the way in which Americans pride themselves on being a nation of immigrants at the same time that we have this very odd history of being hostile to immigrants. And it is a very much of a, a yin yang, a uh, one day we're one way, one day we're the next way, day. Uh, when I was growing up, of course, the, the high school textbooks all had their sections on immigration, and we got the kind of pride of immigration. So there was uh, um, Andrew Carnegie and, and Alexander Graham Bell uh, from Scotland. By the way, he was actually a Canadian at first. Um, and then you know we'd get uh, the Swedish engineer John Erickson. We'd maybe get Jack Warner and his brothers from Poland, who of course created Warner Brothers and modern Hollywood. Um, with then every book would have its section on the post uh, on the World War II era scientists who all came and helped us win the war. Einstein from uh, from Germany, Edward Teller from Hungary, Szilard from Hungary, Fermi from Italy, and of course skipping over the most important post-war scientist, the Nazi uh, rocket scientist um, Werner von Braun, who of course used slave labor to build rockets to, to bomb uh, London. But we didn't talk about that immigrant because uh, he slides in uh, without anybody really noticing it. Uh, if we were going to do kind of modern immigration today, uh, it would perhaps be Andy Grove from Hungary, the founder of Intel, uh, Vinod Dam from India, who invented the Pentium chip, which all of us live by today, um, uh, Sergey Brin, the co-founder of Google from Russia. Um, and then, of course, there's always the cultural litany of what immigration has brought to us. So whether it's Irving Berlin from Russia, Cary Grant from England, uh, Greta Garbo from Sweden, Peter Lorre, my favorite foreigner from Hungary, um, Sophia Loren, Zsa Gabor from Hungary, um, or more recently, Natalie Portman from, Isra Portman from Israel, Arnold Schwarzenegger from somewhere. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, Dan Aykroyd, our favorite Canadian, and who could forget Eddie Van Halen from the Netherlands, uh, who have all enriched music and art and culture. And I could, I, you know, if I were to list all of the people who have come to America and done this, it would take all morning. Um, and then on top of that, we always get the kind of the sports litany. 
that goes with it. You often the sons of, of immigrants. So Lou Gehrig, whose parents were German immigrants, Joe DiMaggio, whose parents were uh, Italian immigrants, Hank Greenberg, whose parents were Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe, um, Yao Ming from China, uh, Fedorov, the, the uh, tennis player from Russia, uh, Martina Natrovova from uh, Czechoslovakia, Wayne Gretzky, another Canadian, uh, uh, Matsui from Japan, and arguably our greatest immigrant athlete of our generation, of course, Mariano Rivera uh, from uh, Central America. So, so we see all this. Now, of course, what's missing in, in this litany is always when we do immigrants, we never talk about the uh, the forced immigrants. So, so, so we reserve, for example, African Americans have a different place in the in the historical study. We never think of African Americans as unwilling immigrants, but of course, most of them were before the Civil War, and then after the Civil War in the modern era. Of course, there's been a huge immigration from Africa and the Caribbean. So that today, if you go to Broadway, you can of course watch the. Uh, the, uh, everybody's favorite, favorite West Indian immigrant, right, Alexander Hamilton. Uh, but sooner or later, maybe we'll get a play about the more modern West Indian immigrant, uh, or, the, or actually the son of West Indian immigrants, Colin Powell. Uh, and, and, and so we need to begin to see immigration in, in even much broader terms than it was historically done. Um, one of the fascinating things is if you look at American politics, you see that from the beginning to the present, immigrants and the children of immigrants have played a fairly significant role in American politics. 10% of the first Congress were foreign born. Now, this isn't surprising since, the, of course, America was a young nation, but it still means that from the beginning, people who had only recently arrived are at the Constitutional Convention, they're in the Senate, they're in the House of Representatives. And it is significant, of course, that when the Constitution provides that the president which would be a natural born citizen, there is an exclusion for people who are born outside the United States, but are citizens at the time of the adoption of the Constitution. So for example, James Wilson, who is one of our first Supreme Court justices, who was a Scottish immigrant, could conceivably have been, have been president, as could have the kid from, from the West Indies uh, if he wasn't hated by so many people. Um, or if he had had better songs about him in the 1790s. We don't know, we don't know which it is. Uh, but but uh, for, for, for example, um, in the last half century, we've had two secretaries of state who were immigrants, uh, secretary of treasurer, two ambassadors to the United Nations who are either immigrants or the children of immigrants, uh, including our current ambassador to the UN. Um, we have a number of other people who are, who are um, children of, of immigrants, including now, as I've said, uh, and I believe that, that our current president is the first president to be the child of an immigrant, which, which makes the idea of building a wall to ban immigration even more astounding, uh, c coming from somebody who clearly has forgotten who his mother was. Uh, and uh, in the last presidential election, for the first time, we had four viable candidates who were the children of immigrants, uh, uh, Senator Rubio, uh, Senator Cruz, Bernie Sanders, whose father was a Polish immigrant in the 1920s, and Donald Trump, whose mother was from Scotland. Uh, the interesting thing about Ted Cruz, of course, was is that he was not born in the United States. Uh, and I uh, argued, if anybody's interested, you can just Google my name and Huffington Post and Ted Cruz, and you can get the whole argument. But, but I argue that, in fact, Ted Cruz was not eligible to be president because he is not a natural-born citizen. Um, but we could discuss what natural-born means. Uh, and any of you who have, of course, um, like the play Macbeth can think about that in lots of different ways. Uh, in any event, the, uh, the um, 19th century Senate was full of immigrants. 
Judah P. Benjamin from the Danish West Indies, Pierre Soule from France, David Levy Yuli from the British West Indies, Carl Schurz from Germany. In the modern era, Robert Wagner, uh, the senator from New York. Uh, S.I. Hayakawa, who was a Canadian of Japanese ancestry, Rudy Boschwitz from Germany, Mel Martinez from Cuba, uh, all were immigrants, not even the children of immigrants. Um, so we are a nation of immigrants. We have always been a nation of immigrants. And uh, we all at least are raised with the notion that we should look to the Statue of Liberty and the poem by Emma Lazarus, who, by the way, was not an immigrant, not the child of an immigrant, but in fact, a, uh, her family had come uh, to the American colonies well before the revolution, although uh, she was a Jewish American, so people always think, well, she must be immigrant. But her family was as, as old as you could get. Uh, without having been a, a, a Protestant from England. Um, and of course, she writes, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. And um, the question is, is that who we are? Uh, the Statue of Liberty, of course, is the symbol of all this. And I want to personalize this for just a minute, because I am the child of, uh, the grandchild of four immigrants. And both and two of my grandparents told me as I was young about the image of seeing the Statue of Liberty coming from Europe and, and what that meant to them. And if you were to poll people who talk to their immigrant grandparents and parents, this is a symbol that is said over and over and over again. Um, and my experiences, uh, my family's experience is, is quite typical. Um, I am the face of the illegal alien, OK? Two of my grandparents were illegal aliens. Uh, and this is fairly common among Americans, even though they don't know it. So my father's father had uh, bad eyesight. And in the 1890s, the United States began to regulate immigration. I'm going to talk about the general regulations in a, in a minute or two. But we, we began to regulate immigration for health reasons. And if you had trachoma or possibly glaucoma, you could be excluded. My grandfather didn't know what these words meant. He only knew, was, all he knew was is that you got sent back at Ellis Island if you had bad eyes. He had bad eyes. He wasn't going through Ellis Island. So my grandfather went from southern Poland to, um, to Hamburg, from Hamburg to Liverpool, from Liverpool to Halifax, from Halifax to Montreal. And from Montreal, uh, by this time he spoke pretty good English. It had taken him a couple of years. From Montreal, he took the train to Plattsburgh and crossed in as a tourist. And then took the train down to Manhattan, uh, moved into the Lower East Side, where the rest of his family had been for a year or two. And uh, after about a year, figured out that he didn't have bad eyes in the way the law said you couldn't have bad eyes. So he took the boat out to Ellis Island and legally immigrated. <laughs> um, today, that would get him busted. Today, he'd be back in southern Poland. Because he lied when he came across the border that he came, he said he's coming as a tourist. He wasn't. He was coming here to stay. My other grandfather arrived when he was about 13 years old, sometime around 1914 or 1915. But he told the immigration people he was 16 because he wanted to go to work. And they looked at him, well, all right, you're 16, you want to go to work? We don't care, go to work. Goes to work. And then along comes 1917, and he gets a letter from the President of the United States. Greetings from the President of the United States. Uh, Uncle Sam wants you. Um, and he can't very well go to the draft board and say, well, you know, I'm only six, I'm only 17. You can't draft me yet because the records say you're 20. So my grandfather came in and lied about his age, which is enough today to get him deported. So um, when you think about the illegal alien, when you think about our immigration laws, think about me. 
Uh, I did, again, I did a piece on Huffington Post on this with two other uh, law professors, uh, one of whom is a Chinese American whose grandfather was what was known as a paper son. Because uh, after World War I, it, it was virtually impossible for Chinese to immigrate to the United States. However, there was a small little industry that went on in which American-born Chinese men would go back and visit the family in China. And then a year or two later, they would be contacted and told that they now have a son living in China from their visit in China. And um, here is some money to pay for your son's passage. And then the son would come over at some point claiming to be the son of an American citizen and therefore could get in. So my friend's father, who he's now a, a law professor at the University of California, Davis, his father, his, his grandfather was a paper's son. He came over illegally uh, because, of course, all this is pretend. It isn't really a son. Uh, but that, that, that was one. And the third guy I, I wrote this with is a, a Hispanic American. American from uh, the borderlands of Mexico and uh, New Mexico, and his family never knew which side of the border they were on. They owned land on both sides. They had been there since before the United States invaded Mexico in the 1840s. And so uh, they're illegal because they can't prove where they were actually born. So that's the face of the illegal alien. And that's something to think about when we think about the fact that we are a nation of immigrants. When I published this, I got dozens of emails from people around the country saying, that's my family. That's my story. My favorite one was somebody who said that their, their father came over, their grandfather came over um, as a young boy, and you had to be over 18 to come by yourself. And he came by himself well under that age. And he made friends with a family which had about 12 kids. And when they got off the boat, he just got in the middle. Uh, so he got off the boat in the middle and got a new last name, of course, because he got the name of the family that he was with. But that's how he got in. So, so, that's, so that's one piece of the history of immigration. Another piece to think about as we think about immigration as being a political issue today is that from the beginning of the country until 1921, we had steady, large numbers of immigrants coming from various parts of the world. Starting in 1921, the United States began to restrict immigration. And the, uh, immigra the immigration quotas under the 1921 Act were that, that nations could have up to 3% of the total number of people from that country that were here in 1910. So for example, a country like Italy, which had a, a, a couple of million Italian Americans by 1910, could get 3% of that number as immigrants. In 1924, it was reduced to 2%, uh, but it was based on the 1890 census, not the 1910 census. And of course, what the 1890 census does is allow for the exclusion of almost all people from Eastern and Southern Europe, people from the Ottoman Empire, so the Levant, uh, as well as, of course, a complete exclusion of anybody from Asia, because that also comes into the, uh, well, anybody from East Asia, anybody who is, quote, Asian or Oriental, as it would have been described at the time. And there is a wonderful uh, a number of cases, uh, wonderful in the sense that as a scholar, you're always interested in, in weird, yucky stuff. And, uh, and, and, and these, are, these are cases in which federal judges are trying to decide whether Armenians are white or not whether Syrians are white or not, because they're from Asia, but they don't look like Chinese. But are, do, they, they, do they come in? And can they be naturalized citizens? Because the other aspect of US law was that under the, 18, under the 1790 Naturalization Act, only white people could be naturalized. 
And then after the Civil War, we changed that to only white people and people of African ancestry could be naturalized. And so you have this huge number of cases. And again, if you have students who are interested in this, you know, you want to send them to your law library as well, of course, to, to the, and, I, and I'm not, I was, to, I was told that I'm not supposed to be doing product advertising here. I'm just supposed to give you information. But I want to tell you, as, as a working scholar, and I have written probably more than any person ought to write. I've killed too many trees. Um, there is nothing better than the US serial set out there for knowledge, for information, for research. If you have students who want to do something on anything, it's going to be in the US serial set, particularly if you're doing 19th century and early 20th century stuff. You're going to find fantastic reports in there. Uh, one of my favorites is in a Department of Labor report from around 1910, which is titled The Races of the United States. And it's the Department of Labor giving you analysis of the traits of the races, like the Italian race, the Hungarian race, the Jewish race, uh, the Irish race. Uh, not what we think of as race, but rather they're using race the way we'd, we would think of it as uh, ethnicity. There was also, of course, the Chinese race and the Japanese race. Uh, and, and it's a wonderful pamphlet if a student wants to do something about immigration, to see just how weird the United States can get. Because it's not, it doesn't get much weirder than this, but it's this kind of information buried in your stacks, buried in the US serial set, that allows students to really get a vision of how this country developed over time. So that's one piece of it. Um, so in any event, what I was, the point I wanted to make before I got distracted by my own interest in, in the strange uh, is that after 1924, immigration drops dramatically. And as a result of that, most of the people who are today in the position to run the country and I would include in this both the current president and vice president, leaders of Congress, are people who went to public schools, or even private, or more so if they went to private schools, who did not know immigrants. The only immigrants they knew were their grandparents. Uh, I went to a public school in a small town in upstate New York, and there was one immigrant kid in my high school. His parents were Germans who came over after World War II. There were Italian-American kids. There were Irish-American kids. There was a small group of Greek-American kids. I, we, the, the Greek kids and the, and the Jewish kids, and there were very small groups of both. We could commiserate because I had to go to Hebrew school and they had to go to Greek school. Everybody else got to go play baseball. It was really <laughs> unfair. Uh, but there weren't any. Greek immigrants in the class. Oh, oh! I take that back. There was also one kid who was a, whose parents were Russian immigrants. You know, escaped the commies. But that was it. Everybody else had been born in the United States, and their parents had been born in the United States because immigration had almost stopped starting in 1924. It of course changes dramatically in 1965 under the new immigration laws. And, but I think part of the current obsession and fear of immigration is the fact that so many people who are now in positions to run the country are people who never knew immigrants when they were growing up. The, so so when, you, when people are hostile to foreigners, it's because they didn't know them as kids. They only know them as the maid, or the taxi driver, or the person serving them at the restaurant. And they are only seen as, as kind of distant, menial characters in their lives. 
and 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 so th this is this is I think part of the explanation to what I would say is the crisis over immigration that we face in the United States today. Let me let me step away from this this kind of narrative to give you the 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 kind of factual narrative that I think will, will help you understand this. So if we start with, with the United States in, um, in 1790, new country, Congress passes a Naturalization Act, which says that anybody can become a naturalized citizen after two years in the United States. Um, we are a revolutionary country. Uh, before, by the way, before the Constitution is written, of course, naturalization is entirely up to the states. And every state has a different naturalization law. Uh, and you become a naturalized citizen of the state in which you live. Um, but after, after the Constitution is written, the federal government takes over for naturalization. Um, and so naturalization is two years. Then in 1795, it's raised to five years. In 1798, uh, in what are known as the Alien Acts, it's raised to 10 years. Um, that is repealed, and it goes back to five years. And then it settles at seven years for a very long time. Um, in 1819, the United States passes its first law to regulate ships bringing immigrants. So that we are actually concerned about the conditions in which immigrants arrive. At the same time, in 1808, the United States permanently bans the African slave trade to the United States. So we stop one form of forced immigration for the first time in our history. Um, in, and that really, the, the 1819 Act regulating ships is the, um, is the last important immigration regulation until after the Civil War. So from 1819 on, we simply have immigrants coming. Now, what happens during this period, of course, is, is that we begin to get the guys in the shadows, these, these poor immigrants, mostly coming from Ireland. And if you look at this carefully, you see the crocodiles arriving. But if you'll notice the crocodiles, they're actually uh, wearing bishop smiters. This is the great danger from Ireland, is these Catholics coming and taking over the country. And in fact, the, uh, the, the, great, the great fear of Americans throughout the first half of the 19th century is this invasion of Catholics and bishops who are going to come up on our shores and destroy the pristine United States. Here's an, another more obvious example of it. Uh, the Catholics, they're coming. They're bringing their crosses. They're rowing boats. Uh, and um, here you have the, this is uh, right at, uh, around the Civil War. Uh, you'll notice that on one side we have the Catholic priest, the other side we have an Irish immigrant. Uh, one of the things to notice about the Irish immigrant is if you weren't certain, you might think this is a cartoon uh, making fun of African Americans. And the reason for that is because in the United States, when we don't like people, we make them look like they are not from Europe. Uh, and, and so we racialize immigrants. Um, I mean, if you think about it, the, uh, the Irish are probably you know, among the whitest people on the planet. Uh, you know, they're, 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 you know, you don't get much whiter than red hair and blue eyes and pale skin. And, it, you know, and if you live in a part of the world where there's no sunshine, you naturally adapt to having paler skin. Uh, you know, only the Scandinavians beat them on being able to get whatever vitamin D is out there the three days of the year when the sun is there. <laughs> right? But not in the 19th century. And so these are the, 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 the Irish and the, and, the, uh, and, and the priests dividing up the Democratic Party. Of course, the Democratic Party in the 19th century is the party of, the sl of slavery. It's, it's the party of Irish immigrants. It's the party of secession. Uh, it's the party as one, uh, uh, <laughs> here's another Irish immigrant for you. It, it's the party of, as one Republican put it, rum, Romanism, and rebellion. And here we have rebellion and Romanism, and you notice the bottle in the hand. It's the tr it's this is this is the holy trinity of the Democratic Party and anti-Irish, and 
the problem with these Europeans is they're bringing, as this German immigrant is bringing, lager uber alles, that is beer over everybody else. It's the liquor traffic. And here's a better example. We have the lager beer and the Irish drunk. Uh, and so again, in 19th century America, in a overwhelmingly Protestant nation, and, and you have to understand that in, in 1850, probably with the exception of Louisiana, you know, 90% of the United States is Protestant or more. And almost all of them are Anglo-Saxon Protestants with some German Protestants thrown in. And so the advent in the, starting with the Irish immigration in the 1830s and running through post-1848 post, uh, Central European immigration is shocking to American because after the failed revolutions of 1848, you begin to get this flood of beer drinking Central Europeans uh, in, a, in a country where the elite is both Protestant and anti-alcohol. You know, teetotalers. Uh, we're here in Chicago, as some of you may know. Just up the road is is a is a is the suburb of Evanston, where the Women's Christian Temperance Union began, the WCTU. And when I was in graduate school in, in Chicago, uh, the the northern uh, the street that separated Chicago from Evanston. On the Evanston side, it was all sort of park and really nice. And on the Chicago side, it was nothing but bars and liquor stores. Because the good people of Evanston needed their booze. They just wanted to pretend that the good people of Evanston didn't drink. So they would cross the street and pick up what they needed and then go back to Evanston. Uh, uh, OK, so we'll get to the Chinese in a minute. Uh, I didn't forgot what the next picture was. So this is, the, this is the great crisis of the 19th century. And indeed, most of the anti-immigration movements of the, of the United States were directed at Catholics in general and Irish in particular. In 1856, there is a political party called the Know Nothing Party, which runs for president. They run the former president, Millard Fillmore, who had become president when Zachary Taylor died in office. Millard Fillmore was from upstate New York. And Millard Fillmore runs as a Know Nothing. One of the planks of the Know Nothing Party is that no Roman Catholic can ever hold public office in the United States. The other, uh, the other plank of the uh, Know Nothing Party was that any immigrant who comes to the United States must remain here for 21 consecutive years before they could become a naturalized citizen and vote. And consecutive years means if your mother dies and you go home for the funeral, the 21-year clock, clock starts all over again. Uh, and this, this was, now, I, I should have to say on, on, to, to, you know, to defend Fillmore's reputation, I, by the way, am, and I believe the only living biographer of Millard Fillmore. Uh, I, I wrote a small book on, on Millard Fillmore. Um, uh, my, my son asked me, why are you writing on Fillmore? And I, I said, well, it's easy to write on people you like. It's much more fun to, when, when, when it's harder otherwise. But to, to defend Fillmore's reputation, he is not just anti-Catholic. He's also a, a fairly vigorous anti-Semite. And he signs the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 uh, because he doesn't really want to have free blacks or runaway slaves running around in the North either. So he, he's a kind of an all-purpose bigot. And I, and I, and I think uh, I, I think that that's important, you know. I don't want to just single him out as being anti-Catholic. Uh, he never says much about the Chinese because they, because he probably hasn't encountered any yet, because they're only on the West Coast at this time. Um, but, but throughout the period from the 1830s into the 1890s, there are various anti-Catholic, anti-immigration or or organizations. Uh, all over the United States. Again, the Know Nothing Party. There's something called the American Protective Association. Uh, there are various other parties, um, uh, the American Party in the 1840s. Um, so you get um, you know, these waves of anti-immigration hysteria. But in fact, nothing comes of it because the United States is a nation of immigrants. And while this is going on, 
The other thing that's going on is many states are doing everything they can to encourage immigration. So Illinois in the 1840s has a Bureau of Immigration. Illinois is this big empty state. There's lots of land. They've, they've managed to expel all of the Native Americans, so there's lots of land available. You got to sell this land to somebody, and the best person to sell it to would be, uh, would be immigrants. Um, and after 1848, you know, thousands of German immigrants settle not only in St. Louis, but also across the river in, in places like O'Fallon, Illinois, if any of you are from that part of the state, uh, uh, Belleville, Il Illinois, um, and Cincinnati becomes a German city. So there's tremendous um, desire on the part of the the Midwestern states to bring immigrants over, South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana, Minnesota, all become havens for immigrants. There is a map, I believe it's in the US serial set, although I didn't check, but there is a map based on the 1910 census which shows percentage of immigrants and their children. And that's important because when we think about, think about immigrants, it's also to, important to think about their, their first generation American born children. There's a map of percentage of immigrants immigrants and their children by county, and it's colored. So, the, so, so you know, bright red means that the county is 50% or more immigrants and their children. And what's shocking when you see this map is that on the, I could not find a, a, a good one on the internet, and, and, I, and I sadly did not have time to look in the serial set, because I think that's where you can find it. Uh, but the, the South is almost completely white, that is, under 5% immigrants and their children. But what surprises people is not only is New York City bright red, but Wisconsin, Minnesota, Montana, Idaho, the Dakotas are bright red. Nebraska is brought most, almost entirely 50% immigrants and their children. And so the states are ha actually have immigration bureaus. If you went to, if you went to Hamburg, which is one, embarkation point, if you went to, 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 um, to the embarkation points in England and in, uh, and in uh, Holland, you'd find the Illinois Immigration Bureau, the Nebraska Immigration Bureau, begging you, come to our state, come to South Dakota, the salubrious cl climate of South Dakota. <laughs> Uh, the wonderful summers in South Dakota. Visit the Badlands, you know. Uh, whatever you can to get these poor people to come out there. Uh, if any of you have been to Scandinavia, of course, you, know, you notice that the Minnesota really did the best job because large parts of Minnesota look exactly like Sweden and Norway. So, so they were able to get Swedes and Norwegians to come because hey, it's just like where you're leaving, except the land is free, or the land is very cheap. You can homestead out here. So we have this. The other thing that's fascinating, and this goes directly to the obsession of modern politics with immigrants and voting, is that many of these states after the Civil War allow non-naturalized immigrants to vote. So when we talk about aliens voting, Aliens voting is a very long tradition in the United States. And in many American states, you could vote if you were an immigrant and you had not been here seven years, but you had declared your intention to be a citizen. That was enough to vote because voting was regulated by the states. So that becomes the process up through the 19th century until we get to 1882 when we get the Chinese Exclusion Act. And why are we ex excluding the Chinese? Because obviously, they all carry guns and knives, and, uh, and they burn things, and they kill, kill pretty young women. Uh, so they're dangerous. Uh, and the, um, one other possibility is that the blacks who are helping to build the railroad from the east and the Chinese who are helping to build the railroad from the west are going to meet in the Rocky Mountains and take over the country. Uh, there are probably, in many of your libraries, a a number of novels written in the 1880s, 90s, up through about 1915 that are what I call the anti-Chinese novels. Uh, my favorite title, because it says it all, is The Yellow Peril. 
and the yellow peril is about, I, I think the subtitle is, you know, 100,000 Chinese now, millions more to come. They're, you know, and it tells the story about the Chinese are going to take over San Francisco, and then they're going to take over Kansas, and next thing you know, they'll have taken over New York. Uh, and if any of you have been to Chinatown in New York, it's possibly happening. Uh, but, uh, but gosh, the restaurants are wonderful. So we accept it. Uh, but, but the reality is, is that there's this tremendous anti-Chinese uh, thing. And, and how, how do you fo fo solve it? By punching them in the face. And then you get, this is the new Joss. The, the Chinese are worshiping the Statue of Liberty. And uh, here, this is, one again, one of my favorite ones, the great fear of the period. So we have the, the Chinese guy on one side, the Irish guy on the other, eating Uncle Sam. You can see the striped pants. And they finally eat up Uncle Sam. And then the problem is solved when the Chinese eat the, uh, the Irish guy eats the Chinese. And that's going to solve the problem. And the other thing is we should build a wall, the anti-Chinese wall. Uh, th this is 1882. Um, could be 19, it could be 2016, we don't know. But notice that in the background is the wall of China that has been broken. And the merchant ships are flooding in to force the Chinese to trade with us as we are building the anti-Chinese wall. And this does sort of say, show, show a kind of, um, you know, uh, nation of immigrants because we have the Irish guy with the black guy and behind him with the German with the funny beard and, 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 the, and the little hat. Uh, and then just undifferentiated Euro Europeans. I like the guy with the kind of looks like a, uh, uh, an elf hat the, 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 with the thing on top. I'm not sure where he's supposed to be from. But they're all clearly foreigners. And they're helping building the anti-Chinese wall. Um, and this is the other solution. You just get rid of all of these foreigners. Uh, this is from uh, uh, a, a San Francisco newspaper. Uh, San Francisco is deeply hostile to immigrants, particularly the Chinese. Uh, uh, this is a, um, a more modern cartoon. It's very interesting. Uh, the South is having gradualism. Race relations are getting better. And suddenly, this Chinese guy with a, with a college degree comes along. and. Uh, uh, and, the, and the caption is, no job for a racehorse. You know, uh, We don't want Chinese who are actually getting college degrees. Uh, so we'll, we'll turn to the, this set of immigration uh, restrictions in a minute. So, so, the, so the Chinese are, um, are followed by, after, um, in the 1890s, a whole series of, of regulations on immigration. We regulate people for. Uh, if they have criminal records, if they've been prostitutes, if they are poor, if they have communicable diseases, after the assassination of William McKinley, uh, if they are anarchists or communists, we begin to have political tests for immigration. And the idea is to slow down immigration and uh, prevent, um, prevent the bad people from coming in, the bad immigrants from coming in, uh, and keeping in the good Im immigrants. So this is Uncle Sam here in, in 1898, when we are beginning to get serious immigration restrictions, looking at this guy and saying, do we really want you? You're poor. You got a beard. Uh, you, you, you know, oh. Oh, uh, and uh, you know you might be a troublemaker, uh, and then and then we come up with the idea of a literacy test. Uh, notice that it is the the pen is indeed mightier than the sword or the cannon. Defending America with a literacy test, um, and that's the literacy test is is 1917. You now you can't come into the United States unless you can read or write. Uh, what would be fun would be to flip back to that second cartoon where you saw the shadows of the immigrants, because of course vast numbers of immigrants couldn't read and write. And um, many of the people who are probably voting for this law are the descendants of people who came over here illiterate. Uh, this is a, a classic anti-Semitic cartoon of the period. Uh, the Jews, of course, uh, become heavily involved in the, in the fashion and textile industry. And so all the nice, clean, white uh, but by the way, there are, there are big questions at this time whether both Jews and Italians are white. And there are a whole, again, in, in 
in the serial set, in the congressional record, in the newspapers, you can find debates over this. Uh, and so here, the Jews have made the nice, clean, white women the slaves of fashion. Um, and here's the melting pot. So it says the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, the red flag, Bolshevism, the mad nations of Europe. Do we really want our old-fashioned melting pot? And so instead, we have the Statue of Liberty keep out. Uh, you notice that uh, it's the Jewish refugee ship. This is a reference to the St. Louis, which is a ship that arrives in, in 1939. Um, full of uh, refugee German Jews. And of course, they are told they can't come in because by this time, we have strict immigration quotas. Uh, and so the St. Louis eventually goes back to Antwerp. And about a, I think about a quarter of the people on the St. Louis end up in, in death camps. Um, so this is at least showing some sympathy to immigration. This is sort of hostile to the quotas. But what happens is, is after World War II, one, after we've made the world safe for democracy, we decide the best thing for democracy is to make America safe from foreigners. So we have first the 1921 restrictions, followed by the 1924 restrictions, which dramatically decrease immigration for uh, the period up through the end of World War II. And as a result of this, of course, um, hundreds of thousands, if not a few million refugees from Europe did not get to the United States because of our immigration laws. Uh, now, there are people who would say, you know, if it weren't for our immigration laws, the Holocaust would not have happened. That simply is not true because, in fact, um, the Holocaust does not begin until World War II is in progress. And it's, it's not conceivable that had we had completely open immigration, 3 million Pol Polish Jews would have been able to figure out how to get to the United States in the middle of World War II. It couldn't have happened. But certainly hundreds of thousands of people who see the writing on the wall cannot come, not only from Europe, but also people in Asia who might be saying, you know, uh, Japan's pretty scary. There's a war going on in China. Time to get out of here. Sorry, you can't come in. Asian immigration is shut off. And so that's part of the restriction. I, I want to wrap this up because I want to leave time for questions. And I, I, so I just want to say one th thing about the way in which we have regulated immigration, because the history of the regulation in terms of federal bureaucracy, and again, this will get you to the serial set, get you to, to, to congressional records and, and laws. Uh, so in 1891, before 1891, immigration really is, is, is a question of the customs. You know, you come in, you pay, a, you, 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 you might have to pay a tax. There's a small tax to come in. Uh, and except for the Chinese Exclusion Act, everybody else just comes in. 1891, we have the creation of the um, superintendent of immigration, who is an officer of the Treasury Department. And so if you think about it, immigration is about money. And uh, in 1895, it becomes the Bureau of Immigration, which is located in the Treasury Department. By this time, we are requiring that immigrants have the equivalent of $20 US when they arrive, which means the millions of immigrants, there, the, the 10 million or so immigrants who come from 1890 to 1910, uh, this is an enormous transfer of assets from the old world to the new world. You know, huge amounts of currency, gold, silver, is pouring into the United States as immigrants bring this money with them. Uh, in 18, 1903, the Bureau of Immigration is transferred to the new Department of Commerce and Labor. And in 1906, it becomes the Bureau of Immigration and Naturalization, uh, a separate bureau within commerce and labor. In 1913, it becomes the, uh, there's a separate Bureau of Immigration, and it is sent over to the new Department of Labor. And it remains in the new, uh, new Department of Labor for quite a while. So we've gone from seeing immigration as a way of making money for the country, the Treasury Department, to having labor for the huge industries that are growing up all over the United States. And again, if you read uh, any of the books about early uh, industrialization, you know, the jungle comes to mind uh, uh, about, the, about the stockyards. Uh, but it's all being done by immigrant labor. You know, America is being built by immigrants. Uh, the factories are full of immigrants. Um, in 1924, with the creation of the 
strict quotas. We have the U.S. Border Patrol. In 1933, we create the Immigration and Naturalization Service, still in the Labor Department. But in 1940, on the eve of World War II, immigration and naturalization is now transferred to the Justice Department. So immigration has gone from being about economics to labor to about keeping bad people out because it's now a legal issue. And it remains at the Justice Department until 2003 when we create the Department of Homeland Security. Um, I, if it weren't the department, when, when, they, when people call, just talk about Homeland Security, I, was, I first thought it was a bank, you know? Homeland Security, it sounds like a really good bank. Um, but it's not. It's the Department of Homeland Security. And so immigration is now about national security. And that's where I want to leave it, because what we have done is created a nation of where we are concerned about the foreigner, the Mexican coming over. Uh, this is 19... 1930s uh, or 1920s cartoon. Uh, this is the pathway to citizenship. I, I don't want to be too political, but you'll notice that the, the one guy is building the pathway. The guy with the uh, elephant on his shirt is taking it, is, is undoing the pathway to citizenship. Uh, here we have the anchor baby patrol um, slapping handcuffs on the child. Uh, by the way, um, the last time I was in Arizona, which was a, about four or five years ago, there were advertisements all over Phoenix by hospitals for having your baby at one of the hospitals in Arizona with a special way of you can fly right into, into Phoenix from Mexico City, have your baby in this luxury suite with champagne and roses, pay the hospital lots of money because American hospitals are so much better than Mexican hospitals. Now that baby would be an anchor baby too, but nobody worries about that anchor baby because that anchor baby's parents had enough money to fly in in their private plane to have the baby born. So it is interesting to think about how we actually think about children. Uh, of course, you may remember the, the presidential candidate in the last set of elections, Bobby Jindal, who didn't go very far. But of course, uh, his parents were uh, immigrants from South Asia. And some of us thought that maybe Bobby Jindal was an anchor baby. Uh, uh, but that would not be polite to discuss. Um, <laughs> and of course, the danger is that after a while, everything looks illegal. <laughs> and now we are back to show me your papers. And against immigration, so were we. And you're still here. And finally, show me your papers. It's getting a little bit rougher. And Homeland Security fighting terrorism since 1492. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>